Welcome to lecture 29. Today we'll be covering the application to classical play theory. And what is classical play theory? What do I mean with that? If you look at, there's a lot of applications. Say you have a table. Instead of modeling this table as 3D, uh, I could just model it just by tracking the mid surface. Why is that? If you look at this table, very likely the thickness is not going to change when you deform it by putting a book on top of it. Uh, very likely um, the mid surface is going to follow the top and bottom surface behavior. Um, take a piece of paper. I bend the piece of paper. And when I bend that piece of paper, the thickness does not change. Very much, as you say, it will change something. A lot of applications is very beneficial to use plate theory because it's a good modeling simplification. If you have a three-dimensional structure, you can just model the surface uh, instead of the whole 3D structure. As an example, uh, we already learned this already. For example, if I take a beam, and that beam is loaded, uh, you can see here that I can represent that with a single line. So it's a very similar idea. Uh, that we're using, um, we're, we are doing a simplification. A model, we call this a modeling simplification. That's really what that is. So let's look at classical play theory. It's also called the Kirchhoff play theory. And what we're doing here, we're taking a three-dimensional structure And I'm talking this three-dimensional three structure, and this is the axis right here. I'm going to put the z-axis right in the mid-surface. And instead of modeling the 3D structure, we're going to say the, plate, the, the thickness of this plate will not change very much due to bending, axial extension, and things like that. Then perhaps I can just model the mid-surface. And we're gonna say that this is zero and this is A and this is B. And this is the mid surface of the plate. And we're gonna say the transverse normal rotates such that it remains perpendicular 
to the neutral axis. <clears throat> or the mid surface, as you say. After deformation. So we're looking at here that epsilon xz equals zero, epsilon yz equals zero. Because if this normal stays perpendicular to the mid surface, then there's no angle change in the xz and yz plane do not experience an angle change. And we know that because I'm saying that the transfer normal rotates such that it remains perpendicular to a mid surface and it is a 90 degree. So after deformation, uh, it stays a 90 degree. So there's no angle change. And so clearly the shear strains are zero. The transfer is normal. Do not experience an elongation. Or contraction. So therefore what we're saying here is that this thickness stays the same and that's a z direction so that means epsilon z z zero three straight line before in deformation perpendicular to the mid surface Remain straight. After the formation. And the implication here is that the transverse displacement, which is W, is independent of the transverse coordinate. In other words, W, X, Y, Z, which is this direction here, so that's the deflection W, that's the deflection U, that's the deflection V, is W, X, Y, like that. <clears throat> so therefore, I'm looking at a displacement assumption That looks like this, u, small u, v, small v, And so when I look at these assumptions, uh, I need to make sure I can impose. So first let me draw what we're looking at here. That's a plate. So what is this? This U is a deflection at every point through a thickness. Well, small U is a deflection right here in the mid surface. You can see when I put z equals zero, I recover the mid surface deflection. Similarly, here, 
when I put the z equals zero here, I get the deflection v. And in the z direction, I have w. And w is the same, doesn't matter where I am through the thickness. You can see that. While u and v vary linearly through a thickness similarly to beam theory. In other words, if I'm looking at the side of the plate, that's the side of the plate, and this is x, the deflection right here is going to be u, x, y. But the deflection here in the outer fiber, or at some point through a thickness, call it maybe here, is this much. So deflection away from the neutral axis or the mid surface is some value that looks like this, okay? Well, at the mid surface, z is zero, so therefore this becomes that. Now, what we can do now is to try to operate and determine what of these assumptions are correct. So right now, these assumptions have not been posed. This assumption we can check to see if it's imposed already. You can see that this implies that epsilon zz is the partial of w respect to z. And that's zero because this w does not depend on z. So therefore, that the derivative of w respect to z is zero. The shear strains The shear strains we know that is zero, that transverse shear, because the z axis, which is pointed that way, is perpendicular and stays perpendicular after deformation, meaning that the transverse shear strain did not change in value. So the partial u respect to z is just this. where comma from now on is gonna represent partial. So imposing this restriction then theta y, I can find what that is. So therefore the deflection u is this here. And consequently, I'm gonna be using this technique, x switch with y, so then I get the same thing. And you can see there, that's my deflection assumption for u and v. And <clears throat> so now I'm ready to, 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 to roll. We've, we've learned a lot so far, that's my deflections, that's what I get. Uh, and I'm now ready to calculate infinitesimal. Um, you know, I want to der derive a theory. That's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to derive classical play theory from play first place principles. From first principles is what I should have said. And so I'll calculate strains. And the partial of u respect to x. Like that.
And so now I'm going to use the trick of switch X and Y to dig again epsilon Y, Y equals V comma Y plus Z minus W comma Y, Y. You can see here very clearly that <clears throat> there's only three variables that are unknown in this theory. This one, this one, and W. Those are the only unknowns. So I should have three equilibrium equations when everything is done. And, and hopefully that is clear. And then I have epsilon x, y. I should have put one half earlier, so that was an error. And that one is one half. And when I execute this derivative, I get this. And so twice the derivative, I rather put twice the derivative, twice epsilon x, y, if you don't mind, because we know there's a shear strain and um, yeah, so this is good. And then we already know that epsilon z zero. We know epsilon x z zero. We know epsilon y z zero. So in this theory, you can see how the strains only depend on u, w, and v. That's it. That's all we got. And then here you can see how we have uh, the deflection assumptions that we have, okay? The next step is to write the strains a little bit easier to visualize. And I'm gonna go ahead and write in this manner. So I'm going to write it this way. All I've done is rearrange everything here. Rearrange it. So anything that does not have Z, I've rearranged it. So it's clear. Hmm. And just rewrote it nicely. And the reason it's nice to write it this way is because at Z equals zero, you get the membrane strains. And you can see them very clearly. 
So that's why it's done this way sometimes. So now I can look at the internal virtual work, use the principal virtual work. Uh, integrate over the mid surface. So I'm going to integrate through a thickness like that. And now I can expand each of the terms carefully. Here, omega zero is a mid surface. and H is the thickness of the plate. So then I have sigma XX. I have done and substituted everything very nicely. That's all I've done. I've substituted everything very nicely. And hopefully you can follow me along uh, I'm pausing for a second to make sure you can check my work as I usually will make a mistake here and there. So I don't want to make those mistakes today. Uh, but I, I want you to realize that I have this term sigma xx, sigma xx right here, sigma yy, sigma yy, sigma xy, sigma xy, sigma xyz. And what, what I want you to notice is that you does not this these quantities here do not depend on z they do not depend on z at all and they do, do not depend on z and so therefore i can take these quantities that I'm marking right now and put them outside of this integral, the DZ integral, because you can see that you look at the assumptions that we have, right? These quantities, I'll raise it again so I can mark it one more time. These quantities do not depend on Z. That's what's called two dimensional theory. While beam theory, order Bernoulli beam and Timoshenko was a one dimensional theory. Here, plate theory is a two dimensional theory. 
And so what I can do now is I can bring, and I forgot a Dell here, I apologize. And I'm checking everything. Uh, and so that internal version work, what I can do is now rewrite it like this, if you permit me. I want to integrate through a thickness there for a second. Sorry. Okay, and and I'll have to continue the next page. So, you know, ideally we'll have everything one page, but it didn't fit. And what I see here is I have these six resultants and they do not look like the ones from beam theory. Here, these are integrated through the thickness. I'm marking them right now so you can see them. And so let's define new stress resultants not seen before, or maybe you've seen them, that's okay. And I'll call this N. And I'll call this in. There you go. So these are the axial, these are the in plane resultants force resultants, and these are the in-plane, or these are the bending moment resultants. These are our new stresses in 2D. In 3D theory, the stresses that are internal to the body are 3D. Sigma X, X, Sigma Y, Y, Sigma X, Y, and so forth. When you go to order Bernoulli beam theory, the axial force and the bending moment and the shear force become your stress quantities that are inside the body. that are reacting external forces. And that's why when you do a free body diagram and you cut it, you draw a free body diagram. You, you plot the shear, you plot the moment. And that's why when you move to Timoshenko, you also have a 1D theory. Uh, but here, the reaction forces inside the body are like that, as you see. 
in beam theory, the resultant forces were axial force and bending moment, and the force had units of uh, force, uh, force, pounds. Here, you can see it's integrated through thickness, so this is really pounds per inch. So it's different. It's similar, but not the same. Okay, so now, Can you guys see my screen? So we have several errors that were caught. And that was supposed to be comma, y, comma, x. And the error propagated to here. I apologize. And then we have an error here that's obvious, which is x, y. And hopefully we have it correct here, which looks good. And these derivations, when you go by your memory, it's probably going to have an error. So it's important that you check your work and triple check your work. Uh, full apologies on that. So let's, let's try to examine what these resultants really mean. Let me set a point A here, point B. And when I look at point A and point B, I'll just draw it bigger. And Z is going downwards, but I'm going to draw it here. I'm going to move that vector down so you guys can see what's happening. It's not there, it's here, but I'm moving it here so you guys can see it better, what's going on. And point A, I'm drawing it. I'm drawing point A. So that's Z equals zero right there. I'm drawing point A here. Somewhere. I'm drawing point A here. And that's DA, uh, area DA. And when I look at that carefully, I look at what's going on with that point A, which has an elemental area DA. This is sigma XX, clearly. Because that's normal to the surface. And so, yeah, so, so clearly if I integrate sigma xx through a thickness through this line here, which is what's happening there, if you look at the equation, we're really integrating through this line thickness here, dz. And if I do that, you can see that that's, NXX, I should have written this better, I apologize. And you can see here that that is NXX. So I have a force per unit length that's NXX going that way. Okay, that's what that means. And I can also look at other stress quantities in this cross section. For example, that one right there is sigma xy, x phase y direction. Okay, so that's clearly when I integrate this through the thickness, I get this. And then here I get NYY, and here I'll get NXY. 
let me raise this point B because I don't think it's necessary right now to write it since you can see what I'm saying. So basically I'm doing a cut. If this is my plate, I'm doing a cut inside the plate and that's what I'm depicting here. So you can see what the reaction forces look like. Because it's not, you know, it's not normal. Before when you had a beam, you apply a little P, you do a cut here. So you're very used to it. Oh, okay, that's axial moment. Yeah, but in 2D, plate theory is more complicated. You have to really understand what's going on. Let me now examine what is going on with, so I covered all three of this. Let's look at MXX. MXX is C my XX times Z, this distance. So, so moment typically is R cross the force, right? So in this case, I put my hand, so this Z goes this way downwards. I'll blow it up, so this Z, and that's C my XX. So the moment is going that way. So I have a bending moment pointed that way. I put an arrow like that. I'm sorry, I'm not bending it that way. I'm bending it. Like this. That means I'm I'm doing a a rotation about this axis, the y axis. And similarly, if you draw, draw it very carefully, you will find the moment per unit length for this side here. And it's going to be pointed to the left actually when you do it. is like this. So that's causing the plate to bend about the x-axis, if you can imagine that. MXX is bending by the y-axis. NYY is bending about the x-axis. And then you have this one here. That's shear. So in this case, I have this condition. So I have to do a cross product of Z versus sigma XY, which means that I have a bending going into the, into the, into the plate. It's like torquing that plate. I'll draw it here. There's not a lot of space. And then I'm also torquing it when you do it with calm at home, going that way. And so, yeah, so that's what you get. Um, and this is your free body diagram. For the plate. So I'll continue and I'll write the internal virtual work again with a new terminology. You can see here that I have defined this. So I'll just write it out one more time. But now I only have to integrate it over the surface.
And now we have made everything look, look very simple. And now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you what the external virtual work looks like. I'm not going to go through all the derivation uh, because I think you can do some. And say you have this plate with some loading here in the top surface. And that's P. And it's acting on the top surface only. Uh, and this is X. This is Y. And so then I have external virtual work equals, there's no body forces. Or we can keep them just so you can see what happens. Let's just body forces like a 1G load, just for fun. And then on the top surface, you have TI, WI, D, Omega, the top, this top surface, where Z is H half of the top. And I'm going to say expanded. Yeah, this is horrible. I was not using those variables. In our situation, we have no traction forces here, no traction forces there for the top surface. We don't have any traction forces anywhere else. So obviously I'm not, I'm just saying that Z equals H half because of that. And uh, del W is small del W. Same here, I'm applying only a body force in the 1G direction. So only this one exists. Let's keep that body force in there just for fun. And this big W, small del W. You can see that this is DZ, D omega, DC, D omega. You can see here that W does not depend on Z. W does not depend on Z. And the forces I'm gonna apply and the body force does not depend on D omega either, but I'll keep it, you know, I'll keep it there. W, this is dependent on the omega, so I cannot take it outside of there. So the external virtual work becomes There's no DZ here because there's a traction vector uh, acting on that surface. So it's only a double integral uh, over D omega, that's it. I apologize for that. But here you do have a volume integral so that if the thickness was minus H half to H half, this is definitely H, small w. And these integrals go from zero to A and zero to B. So why not just add them here plus, and if this TZ is P, the traction P, then I'll add it here. And I'm gonna invoke the principle
which is internal virtual work equals the external virtual work. But I still have to deal with this, uh, which has a bunch of DLU stuff like that. I don't know what to do with that. We need to do something about that. So therefore we have to really integrate our parts one by one. Let's do that now. I'll call this NX. And hopefully you're following at home with me. because you'll be developing another theory called the Reisner Milling theory, which is the analogous to Timoshenko. And in this one, I'm going to integrate a perch in two pieces. I can do the whole thing at once. Uh, so we'll continue then, and I'll, I'll bring all the terms together. Now I want to look at this NX and Y, this, this little normals, I'll show you later what's going on there because it's, it's not your normal N. It's your normal N, but it's, you're going to be in shock when I use it. Uh, but I'm going to arrange all the terms, all the bottom terms here, and bring them, bring them all together. And when I do that, the internal virtual work
plus boundary terms. So internal virtual work equals external virtual work. I bring this to the left hand side and I have the boundary terms, they need to vanish. And when I equate this internal virtual work, pause the video and take a screenshot to this external virtual work, I get the following by the fundamental lemma of calculus of reagents. We get the NXX comma X for any del U, del V, and del W. Where, let me make sure you understand what this means. And then we finally have this equation. I'm so sorry, guys. So sorry. It's not good. That term combines with everything here. So that's, that includes body forces and a pressure applied, which is kind of interesting to have applied a, a load, a G loading of some kind. And I, honestly, you know, we, we could make it more general. We could have made this BZ times H to just keep it more general. So you can apply two Gs, three Gs, whatever you want. And so that's what I get there, okay? Uh, I can now continue, and I'll cover the boundary conditions very soon, but let's keep pouncing along because what I wanna do is, now that I have these equations, equilibrium equations, I think it's worth now trying to write this in terms of the deflections, U, V, and W. And to do that, we can recur, use the constitutive liver relationships, And so I have epsilon xx, one over e.
And so now I'm going to invert these relationships. Because I know sigma ZZ uh, is nearly small, because when I look at the plate, since this is very thin, and Kirchhoff theory is really meant for thin plates, then you expect that through the thickness, sigma ZZ will be close to zero or plane stretch conditions. So if you invert these relationships, you get a sigma XX equals You can switch X and Y to get the other one, sigma YY, and then you get sigma XY equals G times twice epsilon XY. Now we can substitute these relationships into the definition of MXX. But what was MXX? MXX, the definition of that was this. And sigma xx is this. Sorry, that's the constitutive law, yeah? And you know what epsilon xx is? u comma x plus z minus w comma x V like that. And I'll multiply it out so you can see what happens. You know, I'll carry this outside. And if I look at this, u comma x does not depend on dz because u does not depend on z. All the fundamental variables u, v, and w do not depend on z. Recall. So if I have the, in, then if I do this integral, that's minus h half, h half, z, dz. which is zero. So therefore this goes away, that goes away, and this integral is easy. That is going to give you, let's do it here so you can see it. And that's z cubed over 12, or h cubed over 12, which is quite interesting. That looks like the bending, uh, that looks like the moment of inertia almost, isn't it? And the reason there is no b in front of the moment of inertia is because we're only integrating through a thickness. We're not integrating through a thickness and the width. So that's what's interesting about that. So this really becomes e over 12, one minus nu squared, And you have a minus here, and this is really, and by the way, by the way, this, this is x and this is y, I apologize. That's nu, Poisson ratio. 
There's no minus here. And if I switch X and Y, I'm able to get MXX, MYY. So very similar procedure. So now I'm left with MXY to do. Very similar procedure. And you can see here this term will vanish again because of the same ideas I gave you. Um, and when you multiply everything out, you don't get this for MXY. I invite you to do it at home. And we're going to define a new variable called D. This is convenient. And this is your bending stiffness. Note, I want to do a note, note how D is analogous in play theory is analogous to EI, right? Because EI is E one over 12 B H cubed. D is one over 12 E H cubed. You can see if I set no equals zero, that looks like that a lot. There's a B missing. That makes sense because I only integrated through the thickness. I didn't integ integrate also through the width. If I integrate through the width, I will also get a B here and that will match exactly what I have here. So obviously that's not my case. So that's what we get. So you can see how that's analogous to, to, to plate theory, um, to beam theory. And now I have to do is to substitute MXX, MXY, MYY, which I can find through this transformation into this equation. And so when, when I do that, I'm gonna get something like this. You're invited to do it at home. And you're going to see that you're going to end up with a very simple equation. You're going to get the bioharmonic operator because this right here cancels with the null there. So you get You get a very simple equation. And this is also known as a biharmonic operator. It's 
So now you're stuck to try to solve this. And this does not look very different from Bernoulli beam theory. In Bernoulli beam theory, you got EI W4 primes equals Q for a beam on their distributed load. You can see here that if I have no bending in the y direction, that these derivatives go to zero and you're left very much with something that looks like that. So hopefully that's clear to you. Um, here Q was per unit length. This now is per unit area because you can see that the, we've integrated over the whole surface. So it looks very different, very similar, very analogous. Um, and then you have to do um, the next one. Uh, you can do now these two equations here by calculating NXX. Again, you're going to have to follow the same procedure. And when you do that, you're going to get a No. And you can switch X and Y to get NXX. And you can find NXY. So once you do that and you plug it in here, you can find equations of equilibrium for these two directions, uh, for the in-plane direction, okay? So let, let's look at this a little more. Let's look at the boundary terms now, and that's gonna be uh, really interesting to look at that. We integrate our parts. So let me show you what we've done. Let me revisit. So we cover classical plate theory, which is true for plates that are fairly thin. And if this is A and this is B, and that's H, then this theory, A over H, B over H, we're talking about one, uh, about 15. That's a good approach. And this is called classical play theory. What we're doing is instead of taking a 3D structure, we're just tracking a mid-surface instead. And that's a good modeling simplification because everything, the top surface, bottom surface will follow that mid-surface. And so then I came up with the assumptions for this theory, which is that the shear strains are zero because the normal stays perpendicular to the, the mid-surface Similar to earlier Bernoulli beam, uh, the transverse direction was perpendicular to the neutral axis. The transverse normal does not experience elongation or contraction, so that's why this is zero. And a straight line before deformation, perpendicular to mid-surface, remains straight, and that all that means is I'm keeping this assumption to be linear. This deflection U across the top and bottom surface is a linear relationship of Z. It can, we can make it parabolic as well. There's theories that actually go even up to another term, Z squared. Maybe that's also a good exam problem. And so what we've done, we said that U, V, and W only depend on these quantities. And epsilon is zero is zero because the thickness doesn't change much. And we're applying calculus variations to derive a theory. Every time I go from 3D and make assumptions, I'm making errors. I mean, these are errors, these are approximations. So there's errors. And so calculus of variations, what, what it's gonna do is gonna give you the best answer with the best available information, which is because calculus variation is an optimizer, right? You, you, you're finding the functions that best render uh, whatever function we have stationary. And so then we calculate the strains, the typical approach, uh, rewrote the strains in a nicer way just for fun, calculate the internal virtual work, rename some variables here that could be very useful um, because they have physical meaning. And when we look at them, they're reaction forces. They're reaction forces inside the body. We then showed you what they look like um, here. It looks very messy, but hopefully you can see that. Uh, I'll draw a top level view so that's nicer even. 
for you. That's torque in the plate. And there's that bend in the plate. So I've drawn everything. Uh, and you can also draw them on this side if you wanted to. But let's look at, so that, that was it. Then I calculated uh, the internal virtual work, remove the comma x's, y, and all that. So we can come up with the internal virtual work. And then the external virtual work is here. And I make the internal virtual work equal to external virtual work. And then by integrating my parts, I combine all the terms to get the three equilibrium equations. And then after that, I substituted a constitutive law for a plate and came up with the Gorman equation for bending. And then if you substitute these equations into these two here, you'll get the in plane, two additional Gorman equations, which I won't do because it's the same process. But what I haven't done yet is to talk about the boundary conditions, which are quite complicated. I think need to be discussed in extensive detail. So let's look at external boundary conditions. What I want you to know is this NX and this NY, what that really means is going on here. Let's draw a plate here. And this is X and that's Y. NX is really that. NY is really that for a plate, a rectangular plate. So obviously NX is one or minus one here. So it's one here and minus one here. And so that's why you're gonna see me not write NX because NX obviously has a value of one here and a value of minus one here, obviously. And so that's why I don't have to write N anymore because I'm not doing a circular plate where it could be just a random N vector. So that's why I want to make sure you understand that what I want to do now, I want to take the cross terms and transfer them into a clean piece of paper. And anything I'm integrating on an X, so anything I'm integrating on X means I'm integrating by parts from this edge to this edge. So the integral should go only from zero to A. So if I'm integrating by parts on X, I really have an integral that goes from zero to, I'll say, I apologize, from zero to B, this way. So if I integrate a perch in X, then I have the normal N, and then the only thing now is left is to integrate from zero to B. So let's come back, let's start that process, and it's gonna take me a while. And the integral goes from zero to B.
and make it like that, 0 to A, because again, we know there's a rectangular surface, and I integrate by parts on x. That's why there's not dx anymore. I'll write the next one later, but it's not necessary because I can just do the x and y thing. Right? I can just do that. What I want you to notice is, and all I've done again is take the cross terms. You can see that here. Every cross term that has an x, like that one, that one, that one. Even this one here, that one. All the ones that have an x have been transferred. You can see that here. So now all I have to do is to examine that a little bit more. I'm going to do a little trick. And it's a trick that's typically used in these kind of problems. We're going to integrate these by parts one more time. And that's done uh, to get rid of that comma y there. And when I do that, I get this term. This goes back into the integral. It gets added to that one. This cross term, though, is in the integration per parts on ny, which means it's also a term that now gets evaluated at the four corners of the plate. We call these the corner conditions. And these guys here will give us the boundary condition for the rest of the plate. At edge, x equals 0 or a, you have essential and natural boundary conditions. In our situation, we have nxx is 0, because we didn't specify any edge load. We could have u is specified. And I'm going to be smart. I'm going to say, okay, I can actually write the ones for edge x, y equals 0, y equals b by making x to y. That's really what I have to do. Right? We, we don't have to do anything else. Then we have this boundary condition too as well as mxx is 0 or W comma X is specified. So we have four boundary conditions per edge, as you can see. And I'll explain this a little bit more, but I can now get the edge for edge Y equals zero or Y equals B make switch X and Y. And you can see here, I get an mxy for the corner, but I haven't done the other integral from 0 to a. I didn't do it because it's just switching x and y. So in reality, you're going to get two of them, mxy. You're going to get two of the mxy's at the, each of the corners. And so I get to illustrate what that looks like when you actually do it. 
you can get two MXY going that way. You can say that's making the, the, the plate torque is either MXY is zero or W is specified. So we found all the boundary conditions. I want to go and pay attention to this a little more. The, this right here is a shear load. That's really what it is. So, it, you know, that, that right here, this whole thing there is VX. And that VX is an effective shear. We call that effective shear. And if you were to apply, if you were to apply this X, Y idea, you also gonna get something similar for V, Y. You can get that this is your effective shear for that edge. Okay, so that, that describes uh, Kirchhoff plate theory. This is Reisner Minden theory. Will not be discussed here because you will derive this. It's simply now a thicker plate. And it's analogous to Timoshenko beam theory. In here, the cross the normal to the mid surface. can change angle with respect to the mid surface. Therefore, this theory is more general. But more expensive. Why is that? Let's look. So the deflection is UXYZ. These ones, one, two, three, four, five. These are the five unknowns now. While in Kirchhoff theory, there's only three unknowns, which are U, V, and W. So this is more expensive theory, of course. Um, you're not setting these now to the, you, you can recover back Kirchhoff by setting these to minus W comma X, of course. For Timor, this is for uh, Kirchhoff, if you did that. So you get five Gordian equations as a consequence. And so there you go. This is what we have. And this is what's amazing about what we've done. We, we demonstrated the power of calculus variations to derive a comprehensive set of analyses, um, government equations, boundary conditions. Notice how I got the boundary conditions just quite literally, naturally. Like I didn't have to try hard, I just got them. Uh, and every edge now, instead of simply support, you, you, could, you could have a combination of boundary conditions, for example. You could have an edge that's clamped, which means that all these are zero. The UV, W, W, comma, X is zero. You can have a variety of boundary conditions on each of these edges. Let's examine, for example, the situation of a I'll give you an example, boundary condition with a roller. But that roller doesn't look like the ones with beams, it's like, like that. Now the roller looks like this, this is your plate.
and now that's your roller. So that means that it can move in the U is free. Uh, this direction is not free. So V is specified here in this example. W is specified in that way, on the whole edge, by the way. It's allowed to rotate and it's allowed to move in the U direction. So U is free. Because U is free, it's not specified in that example, then NXX has to be zero. So depending upon what you have, what combination you have, you have different uh, boundary conditions. And I can keep getting fancy. I can put a, the plate. On a roller that goes like this. It can move in all directions. So clearly. U is free, V is free, but W is known, and W prime, the slope, is free. So then you can go back to your binary conditions and examine that to really understand what is going on. With that said, I'm very excited that with the Kirchhoff theory, the problem is that how can you solve this equation? There's not exact solutions for the biharmonic equation. May not exist, which means it may be better to develop, to solve, use approximation theory so use the total potential energy for the plate pi and then substitute an approximation for u, v, and w. It will have the same form, typically what we discuss in class or writing. This is what we get. We substitute that into pi and take the derivative of pi respect to CIU like that. Okay. So yeah, so that's the approach. Uh, the simply supported plate has an exact solution. Uh, you can substitute for fees on W, you can substitute sine functions that look like this. For simply supported, you can show that that's a good, uh, and it's gonna give you the exact solution if you add an uh, infinite series is gonna work. Okay, so that, that's great. We've developed classical play theory. Uh, very good. Uh, now we are geared now towards moving into the next step, um, which is going to be application to fine elements. So I covered classical play theory. I'll put one more video in, on membrane theory. Um, okay. An error was found that needs to be corrected. Uh, these are all minus signs. That's my mistake. I apologize. Uh, but have a good day.